does Pat Narduzzi really want to limit NIL and the money that players can make from NIL? What do we think of Pitt's non-conference basketball schedule? And is it time to put a stop to those commitment tweets that come out? We're going to try and cover all of that on today's Morning Pit here on YouTube.com slash PantheLair.com. All right, it's Thursday here on the Morning Pit, YouTube.com slash PantheLair.com. I don't know if we'll get to all those topics because i got a few things to say about each of them, but we're going to try and get to as many as we can. I'm Chris Peak from YouTube.com slash PantheLair.com. I'm mostly Chris Peak from PantheLair.com, but sometimes the websites that I'm trying to say get jumbled up in my brain, and I say one when I mean to say the other. But you know the site, though. Nothing gets jumbled up about that. Panther-Lair.com, Pittsburgh.Rivals.com. The most comprehensive source of pit sports news on the internet, football, basketball, and recruiting. You find it all at pantholair.com and, of course, message boards to interact with hundreds and thousands of other pit fans all day, every day at pantholair.com. And the pit fans have had plenty to talk about today and yesterday and the day before. And there's always something going on in pit sports. Of course, our YouTube channel here, youtube.com slash pantholair.com, like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss any of our exclusive pit video content. These morning pit videos that we run every day of the week, Monday through Friday. Our live show like we did last night at 8.30 p.m., the weekly live show at YouTube.com slash PantheLair.com. Me and Jim Hammett getting together to talk a little pit sports. And then player interviews, recruit interviews, practice highlights, post-game press conferences, post-practice press conferences, all kinds of things like that. You'll find them right here at youtube.com slash pantherlair.com. Let's jump into some of the stories. And Pitt went down to Charlotte. Pitt went to ACC Media Days. Pat Narduzzi had a microphone, and Pat Narduzzi spoke. As he is wont to do, Pat Narduzzi made some headlines. And I don't know if he always wants to do it, but uh, let's just get into the quote. Let, let's start off with a quote of what he said, and then we'll go from there because i i think it's important to start there i think it's important to start with the quote itself pat narduzzi asked about nil I, and actually i don't even know what the question is he was asked something about nil or what would you do if you could change something about nil or something along those lines here's the quote brian murphy from uh wral uh i think in raleigh tweeted this out i mean all, all the reporters who were down there tweeted this out uh, but this was Brian Murphy's approximation of the quote. Uh, it says, good to have you down here. I think the most important thing, it, this is quote, I think the most important thing is if I had to, there's got to be a lid on it, right? I think everybody wants to play under the same rules. National Football League, they have a salary cap. I think you want to have some type of salary cap. This is what you're allowed to spend, but you can't have universities that maybe have 75,000 students. Those guys are all former alumnus at some point. When you have 16,000, all that thing is going to, it's going to matter. It can't be based on how big your university is because we'll start building more dorms and what are we doing? We have education, that is a priority. And we're not going to have classes full of thousands of kids. We're going to have small class sizes and again, we're going to have small alumni groups as they matriculate through the University of Pittsburgh. I think there's got to be a lid on the thing. There's got to be some type of, if you are going to leave the portal open, there has to be a salary cap so people can't just go overspend, end quote. Eight years of Pat Narduzzi. Eight years of Pat Narduzzi. This is far from the first time, and it's it will be far from the last time. And, it, and it's almost to the point, I think we know how it works with Narduzzi quotes now, setting aside the fact that very few of those sentences were ever actually finished. But I think we know how it works with Narduzzi quotes at this point. And, and it's almost to the point where I'm, I'm actually considering making like a bit out of it on the morning pit this year of, of, of translating Narduzzi or uh, getting to sort of the heart of what he's saying. Because Here's what I found. in the midst of all of that, what do they say word salad in the midst of all those words disjointed and out of context and random stream of consciousness there's a kernel of an idea of what pat narduzzi is trying to say but that kernel of an idea because people don't understand how to interpret pat narduzzi and he can't always clearly make the point he's trying to make what happens is you get people all over the, the world of college football saying this this coach wants a salary cap uh, or this coach wants a cap on NIL money. This coach wants to limit the amount of money that NIL uh, that, that players can make. This coach wants to put a restriction on how much NIL revenue a player can make 
from endorsements of his own likeness. And sure enough, that's the headline. And that's what got run with. And that's what has been written about and attacked. And, oh, well, let's see him have a cap on coaches' salaries. Which, to be honest, if I lived outside of Pittsburgh, if I didn't cover this team, if I hadn't spent the last eight years interpreting and trying to understand Pat Narduzzi's quotes, I would probably say the same thing. I would probably take the same stance and say, look at this coach trying to say that that players shouldn't be able to benefit off their own name, image, and likeness. Or that there should be a limit to how much they can benefit off their name, image, and likeness. I would probably have that same reaction too. But I've spent the last eight years learning how this guy talks and understanding how this guy talks and learning how to dig and find that kernel of an idea in there. Because, and and a few, I think a few Pitt fans actually pointed this out. There is, I mean, there are different arms to NIL. There are different sort of tentacles to it. And one of them is just sort of the the pure, honest to goodness, put your face on a billboard so we can sell more Cokes or Pepsis or Ford trucks or local restaurants or whatever it is. We're going to give Kenny Pickett a meal at some restaurant in Oakland every week so he can take his offensive lineman out to dinner and he can tweet about it and that gives us some, you know, there are those things, right? And, and those, I think Pat Narduzzi would probably say, yeah, a kid should be able to get as much as he or she can get out of that. But I think he would also say that there's more to it than that. And I think we all realize there's more to it than that. And when we talk about schools having an NIL apparatus and we talk about what these collectives are doing, yes, to some extent, they're serving as a conduit between business and player to help the student athlete connect with the business and vice versa so that the endorsement deals can be reached and the revenue can be, you know, money can be made, right? But there is... There's a pay to play element here that money is just sort of getting filtered to the student athletes. And we know this. And I, and I think it's been shown and it's been proven across the college football, college basketball, and throughout college athletics. And it's that side that people have the biggest problem with. I think it's that side that Pat Narduzzi has a problem with. And it's that side that ultimately can only really be managed when it's taken in as an official operation put it another way when you're paying the players when you actually pay the players a salary then you can start talking about then you're not uh you know dealing with as much of that sort of gray area shady element of using money to induce recruits and 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 all these things i mean you you have salaries you have pay structures uh, across the sport and I think, if I know Pat Narduzzi, I think that's the part that's sort of sticking out to him the most, is that part that almost serves as sort of a salary, but it's completely unregulated. Look, I am of the mind that a whole lot of things in a whole lot of areas can be fixed or handled better with more regulation. And and I mean, like... A, we're not going to get into political beliefs here or there, but I think regulation can be a good thing. And I think regulating, particularly if it's something that's completely unregulated, can have positive benefits and a positive impact. And I think regulating some sort of pay structure or salary structure for the players, for the student athletes, is ultimately probably the best step forward and the most manageable step forward, the most you know realistic step forward. And probably the healthiest step forward for the, the future of the sport, of the sports. Because we're not just talking about football here. Ultimately, it comes down to paying the players. Now, that's that's messy, and it's complicated, and it's difficult, and it's challenging. How do you figure it out? Is there some sort of collective bargaining? How do you collectively bargain with a group that has just built-in turnover Every year you have players shifting out and players shifting in, student athletes moving out, student athletes moving in. Every four or five years, you've got a complete turnover from what it was four or five years ago. It's it's a little more challenging, I think, to to find ways to do that, but I don't think it's unable to be done. You know, I, I think you can come up with a pay structure per sport, per student athlete. It can be measured on accomplishments or it can be measured on contributions or it could be measured on service time. And, and, and each sport sort of, in a, you know, in, in a manner commensurate with its, th- that sport's revenue, the student athletes could 
reap some rewards and take in some revenue of their own and you create a salary structure and in that case you you could have something you know approaching a salary cap but you can't limit the actual endorsements that the student athletes take in but if your concern is that they're going to take in money under the guise of you know it's money just getting washed in with the actual endorsements then the best way to do that is to get that money to wash out into something that approaches an actual salary. That is probably the kernel of insight in the middle of all of this, whatever it is that Pat Narduzzi said. You know, I think the most important thing is if I had to, there's got to be a lid on it, right? Uh, wait, uh, oh, and, and see, this is a classic Narduzzi move here. He says it can't be based on how big your university is because we'll start building more dorms. And what are we doing? We have education that is a priority and we're not going to have classes full of thousands of kids. We're going to have small class sizes. And again, we're going to have small alumni groups as they matriculate through the University of Pittsburgh. There's there are like probably multiple good points in that sentence or two. In that paragraph, there are multiple good points and things to actually consider. I understand what he's saying. Oh, if it's if, if you're going to uh, they're, they're tying booster base and donor base and the size of the alumni base and creating more nil opportunities and and giving that school an advantage because they've got more alumni to draw on for nil funds that will ultimately lead to them getting better players and retaining better players and winning more games and it creates an affair like there's actually something there and our school is going to artificially not artificially but our school is going to raise their um, you know, admissions limits or, or lower the requirements and raise the limits and take more kids so they can create a bigger alumni base so they can generate more revenue, you know, more sources of NIL revenue. It, it's a few steps down the line. Uh, but I get what he's saying. But the thing is, it gets all like jumbled up in those words. And then that it comes out about a salary cap and putting a lid on it. And guess what gets all the headlines? Guess what gets all the criticism? It's just, we've, I mean, like, and I mean, you, you probably know, I I've been, I've been following this for the last eight years. I've been interviewing Pat Narduzzi for the last eight years. You've probably been reading Narduzzi interviews or watching Narduzzi interviews or listening to Narduzzi interviews, interviews for the better part of the last eight years. You know, if not all eight, then at least five, six, seven, I mean, you've heard all of these things and things like this where, buddy, you got a good idea in there, but I just don't think it came out the way you meant it to come out. And, and I mean, like, it's not, it's not the first time and it won't be the last time that we'll hear something. We'll say, is that really how you meant to say that? Is that really what you meant to say? And I mean, knowing Narduzzi, he'd probably double down and say, yeah, that was what I meant. <laughs> All right. Uh, Pitt basketball non-conference schedule came out yesterday. We got official dates for it. Um, a few things stand out there. I actually want to bring up the schedule just so I can uh, have the dates in front of me 11 non-conference games two of them in the uh nit season tick uh kickoff tip off excuse me not kickoff tip off when they're going to play two out of these three baylor florida and oregon oregon state they've got missouri in the first ever acc sec challenge and that's gonna be the first time they've ever faced missouri so that's exciting west virginia of course on the schedule again and then uh the others one two three four um Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. One, two, three, four. Yeah, with the other uh, uh, seven teams are not what you would call high major. Uh, North Carolina A and T, Binghamton, Florida Gulf Coast, Jacksonville, Canisius, South Carolina State, and Purdue, Fort Wayne. Um, the, the schedule as it sets up, uh, the North Carolina A&T game is on a Monday, the first Monday in November. They play Monday, Friday, Monday, Friday, two weeks in a row, leading into Thanksgiving week when they bookend th the Thanksgiving holiday with the preseason NIT games, one on Wednesday, one on Thursday. Uh, the next week, they get the Missouri game, the ACC-SEC Challenge on Tuesday. And then they ha they don't have another game until the following week. It's the first week of December when they get West Virginia on a Wednesday. Canisius is on the following Saturday. Then they have no games due to finals week for South Carolina State on Saturday, December 16th. And then they wrap up the non-conference against Purdue Fort Wayne on Wednesday, the 20th. A few thoughts on that schedule. And, and to be honest, like the first thing I, I kind of looked for that I was curious about 
is whether there's an opportunity for the ACC to stick a conference game in there. And I think there is. They got Missouri on November 28th, which is a Tuesday. And they don't have another game until West Virginia on December 6th, which is the following Wednesday. I, I mean, that there's a weekend right there that's wide open. And quite frankly, I, I would guess that Saturday, December 2nd, is going to end up being an ACC, ACC game. They actually played NC State on December 2nd last year. They've got a Saturday there. They'll be, you know, three games between Missouri and that Saturday, or three days between Missouri and that Saturday, and then three days between that Saturday and the following West Virginia game. So it's a perfect spot. It's left wide open. I, I would almost pencil it in as an ACC game there. Um, also, they have... Um, they get kind of a nice run into that preseason NIT when they're going to face Baylor, Florida, Oregon State. They'll get two of those three. The, that schedule will be announced at some point. Um, they get a nice little run into that with you know the Pitt-Johnstown exhibition game opener. Uh, I mean, not opener. That's an exhibition game. And then the, the first four regular season games, North Carolina A&T, Binghamton, uh, Florida Gulf Coast, Jacksonville. That's that's a nice little – that that's friendly. You know, that's friendly. Last year they had Tennessee Martin as the opener and then jumped right into it with West Virginia and then the Legends Classic when they had Michigan and Virginia Commonwealth. Could have had Arizona State in there too. So, I mean, you know, potentially three out of their first four games last year could have been all, you know, high major power conference teams. This year they're going to they're gonna take their time getting into it with those four games, North Carolina, A&T, Binghamton, Florida Gulf Coast, and Jacksonville. So that's kind of a nice ease into it. Uh, before they get to that preseason NIT in the Missouri game and the West Virginia game, probably with an ACC game in there as well. So they get the four warm-up games and then pretty much five real games uh, right in the middle of the non-conference schedule. That's going to be a bit of a gauntlet. And then these final three non-conference games. Speaking of the final three non-conference games, Purdue-Fort Wayne, December 20th. That's signing day. That's the December signing day. So that's going to be a busy day. For all of us, uh, waking up early in the morning, following the fax machines throughout the morning, and then pit Purdue, pit against Purdue Fort Wayne at the Peterson Events Center on uh, Wednesday night. So that'll be a uh, that'll be an interesting one. I, I thought this was interesting. Looking at this uh, schedule, you know, eleven games, twelve teams total, right? Three, six, nine, twelve. Um, twelve teams, uh, and they'll play eleven games against those twelve teams. But out of those 12 teams that are potentially on the schedule, uh, Pitt has lost to five of them. Uh, can you guess who the five are? Can you guess? Well, obviously West Virginia. They're 0-3 against Oregon State. So Oregon State's record against Pitt is 3-0, in case that number is relevant to you at all with, Florida, with Oregon State. Florida is... Uh, Pitt is four and three all time against Florida, so they have a winning record, but they've lost. Uh, they, they have lost three games, so that's three teams. But can you guess the other two teams on this non-conference schedule that have beat Pitt? Jacksonville and Canisius. How about that? Jacksonville and Canisius. And how about they're, they're two and two all time against Canisius, three and one all time against Jacksonville. The loss against Jacksonville and one of the losses against Canisius actually came in back-to-back -back games in the 1978-79 season. All right, and, and so just, I was like, well, that's weird. So I started looking at it a little bit more. Oh, wait, there was something, uh, there was something else weird, but I won't get into that now. Um, Jacksonville and Canisius in back-to-back -back games. They actually lost at Canisius on December 20th, lost by four. And then they went to the Gator Classic, the Gator Bowl Classic. Uh, right after Christmas, played the two days after Christmas. They played Jacksonville first, and then they, they played against UMass. They lost to Jacksonville and then beat UMass. So they had back-to-back -back losses to Canisius and um, uh, Jacksonville that year. They actually played at Nassau Coliseum, which I think is pretty interesting. They played Iona at Nassau Coliseum. I don't know if Iona played all their home games there in 1978, 1979. They lost that game in overtime. But they also, so they, they lose to Canisius, they lose to Jacksonville, they lose to Iona. And I can't vouch for what those three teams were in 1978, 79, but Pitt lost to them and their names that I wouldn't expect to see come up too often in the loss column. But they also beat Duke at Duke who was ranked number three in the nation. Now, our good friend Sam Shula can probably offer more insight on that, but I thought that was really, really interesting. 
Um, the Eastern Eight tournament was played at Civic Arena that year. And here's the last one that that stood out to me about this 1978-1979 season. Um, Dece- January 10th, 1979, Pitt played against Cincinnati. It was a home game against Cincinnati. They went to overtime and they lost 78-75. It was the first time Pitt has used an all-African-American lineup. Hmm. Noteworthy, huh? It, it, these are the kind of fun rabbit hole. I, I think fun rabbit holes to go down uh, when you start digging through media guides, looking up random factoids like what's Pitt's all-time record against Jacksonville? Whoa, they're three and one. When did they? Oh, and they also lost to Canisius that same year. What happened that year? Were they just really bad? Well, no. I mean, they actually went eighteen and eleven overall, and they finished fourth in the Eastern Eight and advanced to. I think they were the Eastern Eight runner-up. I think they lost to Rutgers in the Eastern Eight championship game at the Civic Arena. So. Funny little things, you know, little uh, factoids that you come up with, but pretty interesting. I thought it was pretty interesting. Never got into the uh, question about the Pat Narduzzi tweets about commitments, but we'll uh, talk about that tomorrow for sure. Um, Yeah, we'll also have our mailbag tomorrow. Get some good questions from the uh, Pitt fans on Pantolair.com. Thanks so much for tuning in today, though. It's been a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Uh, Make sure you like and subscribe this video and then check out the website pantherlair.com. Panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. Thanks again for tuning in today. Hope you've had a great week so far. It's almost over. Tomorrow's Friday. Enjoy your Thursday, and we'll talk to you tomorrow on the Morning Pit right here, youtube.com slash pantherlair.com.